Good morning. Welcome to Lincoln Square. So thankful to be gathered together again, to be in God's presence and to be with one another. Um, just a few announcements before we get started this morning. Uh, if you're a visitor with us, we're so thankful to have you. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet on the welcome table and, and when you walk into the entrance. Or if you turn to the back page, you will see a QR code. Feel free to use that as well and leave your information. We'd love to reach out to you if you have any questions about the church. Um, a few announcements in terms of uh, programs and things going on in the church. If you open the front page, you'll see a whole list of children's ministry and youth ministry and some updates for you there. And then if you turn to the back, you'll see a section with our recurring events and upcoming things. Um, one thing to bring out and note is you'll see this uh, paragraph in the back about uh, our mission uh, to Haiti. Uh, as many of you know, Haiti has experienced an earthquake and much loss of, of life and of property and buildings. And um, fortunately, the orphanage that we support is, is doing well. The children are well, but there's a lot of damage at their facility. So uh, if you're interested in supporting uh, the relief effort there, uh, feel free to read that information. We have small groups. Uh, uh, as we get into the fall, um, we're excited to kind of reconvene together and gather together in small groups as well. Uh, at this time, I'd like to uh, invite the children to be dismissed to children's worship, and we will take a time of quiet before we worship together. So children, feel free to, to go to worship at this time. Good morning. Our call to worship is from Psalm 138. Sorry, I forgot. If you stand with us, we can sing here. Sing it and join. Please join us. <laughs>
cast a look on me. Give me sweet simplicity. Make me born and keep me low. Seeking only thee to know. All that feeds my busy may be seated. Let's pray together. Gracious God, help us this morning to see that our lives are empty apart from you. Lead us out of our self-centered, our self-sufficient ways of living. Allow us, God, to, to embrace our neediness as both normal and necessary as your people. And God, we rejoice that you have not left us in our poverty, but you have made us rich in Christ. So cultivate us in us true humility, repentance, dependency, so that your kingdom comes through us as it is in heaven. And Father, we pray especially for the people of Afghanistan and Haiti, to different places dealing with devastation and chaos. And we pray for the vulnerable and those whose lives will be changed the most. We pray for their protection. We pray that in your mercy, there would be a refuge. And in these devastated places, we ask that you would use your church, use your people, we pray, to bring resurrec resurrection life to hearts and bodies in need of rescue and in need of resources. By your spirit, make us, make us aware of your presence. Meet those of us who feel strong and those of us who feel weak in our faith. Meet those of us in our places of fear, in our loneliness, in our concerns about the future, in our children's futures. Lord, meet those of us who, who come with questions and doubts, maybe even hard emotions like anger. Meet us in all of these places with your kindness and grace. Pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. Well, we turn to our time of confession, a time to acknowledge with God our sin and our need of Him. And we'll do this together as a family, as a community of faith, but also have a time of personal quiet confession. Loving Father, we confess that we often try to do things on our own. We worry about how we will be provided for and forget that you give us everything we have and make us who we are. Forgive us for thinking only of ourselves, for not trusting you to care for us. And forgive us when our plans are all working out and we forget that we need you. Have mercy on us, Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. O oh God the Father, creator of heaven and earth, have mercy upon us. O oh God the Son, redeemer of the world, have mercy upon us. Strength. 
please take a moment to quietly confess your sin to God. Father, we confess our sin and we give thanks that you are a God of mercy and forgiveness. You are the God who will leave the 99 to, to rescue the one. That in Christ, through his death and resurrection, you give us new life. And we give thanks in, in Christ's name. Amen. Well, having confessed our sin, let's stand together to hear the words of assurance that come to us from Philippians 1. Verse 6. Please join with me. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. The Old Testament lesson today is from Ezekiel chapter 11, verses 14 through 21. And the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, your brothers, even your brothers, your kinsmen, the whole house of Israel, all of them, are those whom the inhabitants of Jerusalem have said, Go far from the Lord. To us this land is given for a possession. Therefore say, thus says the Lord God, Though I removed them far off among the nations, and though I scattered them among the countries, Yet I have been a sanctuary to them for a while in the countries where they have gone. Therefore say, thus says the Lord God, I will gather you from the peoples and assemble you out of the countries where you've been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel. And when they come here, they will remove from it all its detestable things and all its abominations. And I will give them one heart and a new spirit I will put within them. I will remove the heart of stone from their flesh and give them a heart of flesh, that they may walk in my statutes and keep my rules and obey them. And they shall, my, shall be my people, and I will be their God. But as for those whose heart goes after their detestable things and their abominations, I will bring their deeds upon their own heads, declares the Lord God. The gospel lesson today is from John chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch of mine that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch, and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. The word of the Lord.
Good morning, good morning. Well, our sermon series these last few weeks has been looking at what we call the the benefits of our redemption in Christ. And another way of saying it is that there are these, um, these fruits of what it means that Christ has come to bring salvation and newness into our life. So we've looked at new birth, we've uh, talked about justification, adoption, reconciliation, and now we're going to turn to one of the other big Christian words that we hear is um, sanctification, and this process of being made new in Christ's image and his likeness, of putting away sin and following him in our daily life. So as we do that together this morning, we're going to turn to Philippians 1. Oh, 1 through 11. Will you please turn me, with me there? Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God and all my remembrance of you always, in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart, for you all are partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve of what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. Let us pray. Gracious, merciful, steadfast God, Lord, we ask that you would be with the meditation of our hearts and the words of my mouth, that you would draw near by your Spirit and both challenge and comfort us with these words. We pray this in the name of Christ, our King and Savior. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm sure as many of you, there were certain things that you picked up uh, during lockdown and the pandemic. And one of the things that I really picked up for myself, partly just to even keep myself sane and, and exerting energy, was running. Uh, when I grew up, I, ne I hated running unless it involved a ball, you know, a basketball, a baseball, a football. But I, I began to get a little bit more into running. I, I got so um, into it, at, at, I started reading articles about running. Uh, I bought new running shoes, shoes that were actually running shoes. <laughs> In the past, I would just wear like tennis shoes or sneakers, but actual running shoes. And I as, as the summer went on and into the fall, I saw my progress really improve. Um, I, got, I could run all the way out to the lake, around the lake, and then back again. My, my distance improved, my time improved, my endurance improved. I felt new. I felt alive. And it was, it was meaningful. It was, it was nice to exert myself in that way. But as, as you can imagine, the, the Chicago winter came, and I, I kind of took a hiatus from running. And earlier this year, as, as the weather got a little nicer, I, I kind of wanted to get back into it, kind of get that feeling back of, of exerting myself, of running. And one of, on one of those early runs, as I'm huffing and puffing, not even probably a mile into my run, <laughs> my feet are dragging, and I hit a, a, a divot in the sidewalk, and I literally go into the air like Superman, and I scraped my hands, my knees. I actually hyperextended my elbow a little bit. And so I, <laughs> I sat there on the ground for a split second, one thinking, I hope nobody saw this. 
But in particular, I was reflecting on the fact that last summer, just last summer, I was in shape enough to actually run to the lake and back, and here I was now lying on the ground in pain and hurting and trying to get oxygen into my lungs. Besides feeling a little embarrassed, I felt sort of defeated and disappointed by, by w whatever you want to call it, the setback, uh, the, the regression in my running ability. And I, I wonder for us this morning, as we gather together, if, if that little example, that little snippet into my own life might, might speak to us in, in many different places of our lives, in places where we saw new things or experienced energy or was seeing that things were changing around us, only to see them fall apart again only to see things going back to the way that they were. As we come to look at these benefits of redemption, one of them is this assurance of things being made new again in our life here and now. It can be easy as we encounter the world around us, as we encounter our very own hearts, to really question whether or not that is true. In the process of sanctification, this renewing work of God in our lives is, is important for us to reflect upon as we enter into this. As we live and experience the world around us, we can be left wondering if anything is really changing or becoming new. Am I growing? Am I, am I following Christ? Or am I just languishing and set adrift in my old habits and my old ways? Is there really any hope for change? Or am I just hopeless to fall back into my old way of life and my old way of relating with those around me, my family, my friends? So as we look at this passage from Philippians, I, I have three Ps for us to consider. The pain of renewal, the promise of renewal, and the participation in renewal. The pain of renewal, the promise of renewal, and the participation in in renewal. So the pain of renewal, why is it painful? Why, why is this experience of disappointment and frustration when things seem to be falling back, when things seem to be falling apart? Why, why is that painful? What, what is it about that, that that just grinds against us? Paul opens his letter with a beautiful prayer. It's filled with thanksgiving and warmth and joy. He thanks God for his memories of his friends and these ministry partners back in Philippi. And he wants them to know just how much he misses them. He's filled with this warm feeling and affection towards them. He reflects upon their friendship. He reflects upon the joy that they had together as they did life in, uh, in the gospel ministry together in Philippi. Even now, this this church, this community of believers, continues to support Paul in his ministry work, even from a distance. They send resources and supplies, and they've even sent their own, someone from their own congregation, Epaphroditus, to encourage Paul in his time of need. And I'm sure that all of us in this room can resonate with times where we reflect back on really fond memories delightful memories, joyful memories, whether it's a good friendship or the work opportunities that we've received or seeing real change and growth in our lives and our families and our communities. There's something about this energy for change that just can really fill us with a sense of joy and purpose. And all these memories that Paul is reflecting back on are great However, the reality for Paul and the, the Philippians and, and those in Paul's time, the reality is it's actually not that rosy. <laughs> Things are not actually really going well. You see, Paul is actually in prison when he writes this letter. This letter is one of his prison letters. He's, un, he's most likely under house arrest in Rome, and he's waiting for his day in court 
to make his case before Caesar. We're told that he's under the watch of the imperial guard. And Paul is being accused of subverting the religious and cultural and political powers of the Roman world. Paul's a troublemaker, and he's going to stand trial for this message that actually calls people to change. But it's not just Paul who's in trouble. The church in Philippi also has some issues too. In chapter 2, we, we hear about this rumbling of maybe discord. Maybe folks aren't actually seeking the good of one another the way that Paul would hope they would. And it seems like maybe there's some disagreement. They're not of the same mind and, and unity. And so some turmoil is coming about. And Paul even mentions two church leaders, Udaya and Seneki. I hope I said that right, Seneki. And these two prominent leaders are, are butting heads at least, or they're in disagreement with one another. And Paul pleads with them that they would reach an agreement in Christ. But it's not only Paul's struggles, it's not only the issues in the church that are at hand, but Paul himself almost watched his friend Epaphroditus die on his journey. So much so was Paul brought to grief that he said that he was filled with anxiety no, during this whole ordeal. So as much as we read this letter, it may give us a sense of confusion with all of this happening around Paul and the church, how can he speak, how can he write with such joy? Is Paul just the biggest optimist, or is Paul just disconnected from his reality and just putting his head down? And in the midst of this prayer, in the midst of this prayer, Paul gives us a bold promise and reassurance. He says that he, God, who began a good work in you, will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Paul reiterates this twice. He says, I'm sure of this. And he says, it is right for me to feel this way when he speaks about this completion or this renewal of the Philippians and for us. He speaks from a sense of boldness and confidence. For Paul, this is a reality. Paul has this strong sense that God is still at work around him and his circumstances. And he wants the Philippians to enter into this in the midst of what's going on around them. However, it may be possible to hear these words and really question them. Are these words true when things are really falling apart in my life? When I can't keep up at work or in school? When my marriage is a mess or, or my relationship with my family is, is dysfunctional and broken and harsh? Maybe there's a, a time in your life where God felt very real and present, and yet now it, it feels dim or at worst, at worst, just a fantasy. Maybe you have put away old habits in your life that were harmful to you and others and yet you've only seen them come back with more force and ferocity, taking a hold upon you. Maybe there's patterns of thinking that are toxic, and you've put them away, but now they just seem to hang on a little bit longer each and every day. As, as we encounter these places in our heart and our life that are oftentimes filled with darkness, it can be tempting to think that when we come up short, that maybe we have fallen outside of God's favor and love. If you've grown in, up in the church <laughs> or surrounded by Christians, you might, have, you might have had this promise of God's renewing work, of, of this exact verse, verse 6, thrown at you kind of like a Bible band-aid when you were really struggling or experiencing loss. The issue is not the verse itself or the truth that it's proclaiming, but maybe how it was applied. Maybe it was done in good spirit, but in many ways it was disconnected. It was somebody just kind of putting you at arm's length. But you don't even have to grow up in the church to know that experience. 
We hear trite things all the time in our life. Well, things can only get better. Or look at the bright side of things. If you would just work a little harder, improve your thought life, then maybe you can overcome your circumstances. All these things feel very disconnected when we are truly struggling or in the midst of our pain or even our sin. Yet Paul here is not doing that. Paul does not ignore the real pain that is going on in his life or in the lives of those around him. See, this promise is given into the context of real pain, of struggle, of messiness. Instead, this promise of renewal is given not to those who have it all together, but it's given to those who are suffering, who have lost, who feel defeated and uncertain about the future. The truth is that we actually do not have to have it all together for this promise to be true for us. We do not have to have all the answers. We find that we are at the end of ourselves. We aren't supposed to ignore it, but bring these things into the light, into the truth of this promise that God is at work. So we know and see that this renewing work is done in the midst of pain and suffering, but what exactly is this promise of renewal? Well, God promises to bring to completion the good work that he has started at the day of Jesus Christ, that he will bring it to completion. And this good work he's building off of something that he's already done in our lives. Paul is wanting to remind the Philippians and us that the faith, that that new birth, that that justifying faith is not just the end, but that God is going to bring us to the end. He is going to be and remain continually at work. Our faith is still a work in progress. Our community as believers, as a church, is still in progress. We have not figured it all out, and that is okay. I think there can be two dangers when we encounter this promise or, or the idea of sanctification, of being made new, of putting away old things, of putting away sin, things that harm us, and putting on what God desires for us. One of the temptations is to see our lives as a linear graph. You guys have probably seen this in math or in, or in science classes where you have a linear graph, and there's this concept that as a new believer, our faith is here, and then we're hopefully going to get to a place where we're like at Paul's level, or, you know, maybe just a little bit below Jesus. But that's actually not the Christian life. That's not what Paul is inviting us into. He's, the Christian life is not one of steady progress. It's one of ups and downs. And the promise of, of renewing work, of God's renewing work, is that in those downs, God will bring us up that he will meet us in those places. The other danger is that we come to believe that maybe, yeah, God gave me my faith, and yes, he's, he's calling me as a child, but maybe I have to try to prove it. Maybe I need to make sure that God knows that he made the right choice in my life. And so we, by our own willpower and ability, try to bring transformation into our lives. To be completely honest, there have been seasons during this pandemic in particular that I have felt and experienced my own shortcomings and sin in ways that I've actually never encountered before in my life. It's tempting to think that maybe something is wrong. (laughs) This pandemic or quarantine Eric is definitely not the best version of Eric that has ever been in this world. He is very impatient and angry and lacks self-control at times. And if I were to try to put myself on some sort of linear graph, I would probably be going down rather than up. Being made new in Christ can actually feel a lot like failure. We come face to face with places in our hearts and our lives that are in desperate need of change and healing. In our failures and shortcomings and defeats, That's actually where God shows up. That's where we begin to experience grace and his goodness. 
It might be a little counterintuitive, but it's actually in those deep and dark valleys, those places of trouble that actually sets a fertile ground for where we can grow and experience God's love again. You see, Paul's not writing to a group of people that have it all together. It might be tempting to hear that greeting at the beginning where it says saints, to think that somehow these Philippians are better people. But no, they're just as messed up as you and me. It turns out that saints lie too. Saints cheat. Saints cuss. Saints are greedy and hoard. Saints have anxiety. Saints are filled with insecurities. What makes a saint a saint is one who is loved by God and one who God is seeking to renew each and every day. This promise of renewal is based on God's holy work in us and not our ability to maintain or live up, but rather to embrace His grace and seek His transformation in our lives. There's this quote from Jeff Bridges. He's a a pastor and theologian, and he says this, Our worst days are never so bad that we are beyond the reach of God's grace. And our best days are never so good that we are beyond the need of God's grace. Our worst days are never so bad that we are beyond His reach. That is the work of sanctification. That even in our worst days, that God and His grace is still reaching out towards us. Lastly, as we conclude here, so if God is the one to bring things to completion, and if this completion is something that won't fully be seen in our lifetime on this side of the new heavens and new earth, well then what do we do about it? How do we live into it? So the participation and renewal. As we come to rest and know that God's grace is sufficient for us, we can begin to participate in God's renewing work around us. But we are invited to participate in this work. You see, Paul, this same man who speaks with such warmth and joy and affection for the Philippian church just a few years ago, was a man filled with violence. He was a persecutor. He used his judgment to punish the very same church. And yet we see Paul as a transformed man, not out of his own work, but out of the love and affection that he has received from Christ. As we encounter the love and affection of Christ working in our lives, we can actually move forward in love. Paul's prayer for the Christians in Philippi and for us is that our love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment. Paul speaks of growing in love that is overflowing, that's abundant. It's pouring over the edges of our lives. Now, now I don't know about you, but when I hear that, that is both wonderful and terrifying at the same time. It's wonderful because we all desire to be loved, to feel that warmth around us, and to extend that to others. And yet, at the same time, it is terrifying because to love actually requires us to pour outwardly and to trust that we will be filled, to trust the God who is sustaining us, the God who is transforming us. Can we trust him with that? We heard from John 15 about abiding in Christ, and I would make the argument that that is how we sustain this love that it's not within ourselves, but it's actually leaning upon Christ's love, that as we abide and remain in Christ, we see ourselves and the world new. We can begin to let go of some of the fears that we hold on to, and we can extend ourselves outwardly. We desire to know more of who God is and His purpose in this world, And as our lives and desires change, we approve of what actually really matters. I love that Greek word. It says excellent. That's the translation. But another way it can be translated is what really matters. 
And when our loves begin to change, when we begin to experience this transformation and lean into it, we begin to see others in our lives with what really matters. We can put away these things that have such a hold on us and start leaning into things that really matter, that are good. So we see that this renewal is actually painful, that God's promise is good, and that he invites us into this, and that even in the midst of our pain and our suffering and questioning whether or not God's actually doing anything at this moment, it's actually in that place that God desires to meet us, and that is good news for you and me this morning. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for your transforming work in our lives. Lord, we ask that you would meet all of us here wherever we find ourselves and that you would renew us by your spirit and word and feed us this morning. We pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. If you would stand with us while we respond with singing. Thanks, O oh God, who abundantly pours out your grace towards us. You heal the sick, mend the broken, give sight to the blind, comfort the hurting, and promise to raise the dead to life. Give us faith to trust that your will shall be done as we join with your people on earth 
and all the company of heaven in the unending hymn. Well, the backdrop of our text this morning is uh, this harsh reality that Paul is in prison. And one of the things about being in prison in Paul's day is that when people went into prison, they weren't typically fed by their captors. I mean, they had to rely on the, the generosity, the benevolence of friends to feed them. And, and it's this young church, hundreds of miles away, that send one of their own, Epaphrodites, who Eric mentioned, that, that, to, to, to make sure that Paul was fed. And we have to hear uh, that, that this is almost unheard of in the ancient world to travel this far, to shoulder that cost just, just for a lawbreaker. And friends, I hope you hear it. <laughs> I hope you see it. But this part of the story, it is a beautiful pointer to this table. Right? There is no amount of distance. There is no amount of cost that Jesus isn't willing to travel to pay so that you and I the true lawbreakers who have sinned and defended God himself, he has sent his son to take on our guilt, to set us free, and to fill us up with resurrection life. And so if you believe that, if, if you have in repentance and faith turned to Christ, then this table is for you. Come and eat in faith. For those of you uh, taking communion today, uh, you are welcome to begin to open up to get ready. Uh, if you don't have a communion cup and you'd like to, to do communion, just raise your hand and someone will bring you a cup. All right, I see one back here. Let me pray as we move into our time. Father, thank you for this table. We pray that you would set it apart from a common use to a sacred and holy one. That you would come and by your spirit meet us and nourish us in our faith through the, this bread and wine. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, on the night that he was betrayed after giving thanks, Jesus took the bread. He broke it saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The same way after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. For as often as you drink it, do so in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Christ's body was broken. Let us eat in faith. Christ's blood was shed to cover all of our sins. Let us drink in faith. Father, we're thankful you give us this meal, this meal that sustains us in, this world, in our own wildernesses, the ways that we hunger and need and long for your life, your, your life that sustains us, that nourishes our faith, that, that keeps us on the journey and the hard seasons. Lord, fill us up this week. May it, may, it, may it strengthen us. May your grace move into the harder parts of our own lives. When we're in the down parts, that you would sustain us and lead us back to Christ, back to your goodness and life. We ask and we pray in his name. 
Amen. Well, having come to this table, let's stand together to respond with, with both a prayer and a song. Lord Jesus Christ, you have promised to make all things new. By your spirit, remind us that you have already paid our debt before God and help us to look forward to the future with hope as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ Christ is risen, Christ will Christ.